Fred Fields from Springfield? Yeah, Springfield. Downtown Springfield. Yeah. yeah. Who has who has collected for years and years? I think your dad collected. Yes. Did your granddad collect too? Uh, he was a horse trader. My my grandfather was a horse trader, and uh, that, I think that's kind of where it got started in the family. Was he got around to all the farms? They went around and combined, or if some, yeah, trashed or. Uh, uh, if somebody needed the services of a stud horse or something or whatever, my grandfather knew everybody. So my dad was the youngest son of the youngest son, and he just kind of tagged along, you know, as the spoiled kid. So he got to know all these farmers and stuff. Then after the war, my dad knew all these farmers. They all had Model A's and Model T's and stuff sitting around junked on the farms. So Dad got together enough scrap steel because the price was high. He dragged them back to his home farm and uh, set them on fire and burn them. And then take a pole wax and chop up anything that he could chop up with the pole wax. And anything that he couldn't cut with the pole wax, he had a blowtorch and he cut it up. But of course, used the blowtorch as little as possible back then. But anyhow, I told him, I said, you know, if you had just kept hood ornaments and hubcaps, we could probably retire and all of us live good, but anyhow. So my dad had always went to auctions and whatnot, and he would come home with some of the strangest things. Uh, he, he, I remember one time he even came home with a used casket, and uh, he resold a used casket. He would come home, he came home with a uh, wooden wagon that only had three wheels on it. I said, Dad, you're never going to sell a thing. Guy came all the way from Harrisburg to uh, buy that wagon, so he could sell stuff. But I'm not very good at selling stuff. I just gather stuff up. So I guess I'm here to talk about collecting, and uh, I like to collect antiques. And everybody has a different definition of what an antique is, but uh, most uh, the standard rule of thumb is something that's over 100 years old. Some of this stuff is over 100 years old, some of it's not. I've tried to stick a lot with Hampshire County related stuff here, and uh, we'll kind of run through here and see what we got. Uh, first rule of collecting, you're not going to get rich. A lot of people think, you know, I'll collect this and I'll, you know, I'll really have something. That's not true. If you're going to collect, you want to collect because you like the stuff and it's something that you want and that, that you want to live with. And I do. All this stuff is directly out of my house. Most of it, except for like the pictures, are on display. Um, so, uh, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not a very good public speaker. I'll get to stutter and stammer in here and try to come up with my next thought. But anyhow, I've collected whatever I would come across, you know, that was uh, of local interest. Everything from campaign posters to money at the bank to uh, advertising items and whatnot. So, uh, first up here I've got a uh, John J. Cornwell campaign poster. And uh, I bought this at uh, Lake Watson's estate sale in Levels. And I saw this advertised, and I thought, boy, now that's something, you know, really nice. And I don't know that I've ever seen a John Cornwell campaign poster, but I'm thinking every lawyer in Romney is going to want a John Cornwell campaign poster. <laughs> and I thought for sure when I went to this auction, there was no way I was going to have enough money to buy this poster. But I believe I came away with the poster for $80, and I was thrilled. I, uh, there wasn't a lawyer in sight. And things just kind of went my way that day. <laughs> so, and you got the little badges. Yeah, I also have, it, well, and with collecting, it seems like you buy something, and then you come along something that is related. Uh, at the same sale, this lady had uh, the small campaign badges that, you know, that are familiar nowadays. And a lot of people do collect the campaign badges. And they're John Cornwell also, and I'm <coughs> tickled to get those. 
Then uh, a while later, we went to a sale out in Augusta, and they sold a lot of stuff. It was interesting. But uh, some guy in North Carolina had been there and bought a bunch of pictures and miscellaneous stuff. And in that one box was a invitation to John Cornwell's inauguration. So uh, uh, I bought that over eBay. I, di I didn't bring that with me today, but I did, uh, did happen across that. And it's funny how you can look and look and look for something for a long time. And then when you up and find one or buy one, it seems like you'll come across three or four. It, it just seems to happen to work out that way. But, uh, up front here we've got uh, a Hampshire County rifle. It's signed on the top of the barrel here, Benjamin F. Shane. And I believe he shows up in the uh, 1830 census in Augusta. And uh, Hampshire County, collecting long guns is a pretty popular thing. There was uh, an awful lot of uh, gun makers here in Hampshire County. I believe when, uh, when they raided the armory at uh, Harper's Ferry, there you go, uh, they took all the guns from there and brought them to Hampshire County and had the Sheets family convert them from flintlock over to percussion. And uh, the Sheets family was a, a, a big family of uh, gun makers, and they are very, very, very collectible nowadays. Uh, so, um, I got this piece from my dad. Uh, he was at a sale in Beverly, West Virginia, and it has a painting on the back. But anyhow, I consider this the front. I'm sure whoever painted the painting considered the other side the front. But uh, Mr. Kump was a judge here in Hampshire County and was also governor from Hampshire County. We've had three governors from Hampshire County. Uh, Jacobs, I believe, was the first. And I'm not sure whether Cornwell, Cornwell was probably before Kump. Yeah. And uh, Kump was the third one. And I don't have. So yes, sir. What were the time frames of the governor? Um, I know Cornwell uh, went into office in 1917, and I think Jacobs was about number three. Okay. He he was, and I believe Jacobs was basically appointed by the B&O Railroad. Thank you. The the B&O was a big <coughs> part of getting the state of West Virginia uh, formed as a state. They wanted the timber and coal out of the mountains, and they didn't want to let, it. yes sir? I was thinking that the Governor Kump was different from the Judge Kump. Oh really? I, I think, I think well, Governor Kump uh, actually lived in Elkins at the time he was Governor. Isn't that right? I'm, yeah, I'm not right. sure. I, you're right. I, yeah. and okay. He, so. Wasn't he a brother to the, yeah. to the judge? Was really? He, okay. I so, and, and they, the, they were both born in Highview. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh really? Yeah. Okay. So see there I'm learning something. Um, that, that's another part of collecting. You learn, I was telling Norwood there earlier, that I didn't realize that the New Century Hotel, most anybody that had spent time in Hampshire County knew the New Century Hotel. But it started out as the Keller Hotel. And then from the Keller, it went to the Century Hotel. Well, you tear down the Century Hotel, what do you put back in its place? The New Century Hotel. And that just never clicked in my mind, but through collecting, I learned that little tidbit of useless information. <laughs> were, so. were you here with Mrs. Uh, uh, Miller or Mrs. Uh, Hardy. Mrs. Hardy talked about the Keller House? No, I was not. Uh, I, I you missed that. watched the video on that. Just, uh, okay, her. I, to, I, I had her for uh, English in high school. So. It was her grandmother's. I, well, I think everybody had Mrs. Right. Hardy for English in high school. Her grandmother's family had her. Oh really? Oh okay. Okay. Uh, I, well, we'll get to postcards later. Um, th these are something that we've gotten into more recently. These are Christmas ornaments, and uh, they're generally known as kugels. They're, they don't have any relationship to Hampshire County. Just uh, a collectible that we brought along that we thought these are some of the uh, first glass Christmas ornaments that they hung on Christmas trees. 
And if you come up and pick one of these up, the, the, they feel like the wall of the ball is like a quarter inch thick or something. And uh, we, we, they're one of our latest targets for collecting. What's the date on that? The, the early, the early uh, ornaments yeah. in this field would be in the 1850s. Wow. And I, I think they made them right up around till the turn of the century when they got to making the uh, thinner walled, what they call a spun glass ornament. So you mentioned that there's something inside, it was painted. The mercury, the, these actually have, and that's probably part of the reason why they did away with them, they, they actually have mercury inside them. Oh, so, it, it's, it's liquid? It's, it, no, it, it, it may have been put in there as liquid at the time, and they dumped the excess out. But, uh, yeah, if you take a flashlight, and, and a lot of the collectors, they carry a flashlight with them, and if they can see the light shining through them, then they don't want the ornament. And, and the ornaments come in, well, Kugel means ball in German, so this makes sense, right? Um, but then they got to making shapes, and uh, they come in a variety of shapes, of course, different shapes, different values. Values, there, there's another subject. What, what's the most commonly asked question in collecting? What is it worth? Only to the person who wants it. Exactly. Good answer. And, and the thing is, everybody asks me, what's it worth? And I tell them, it's not worth anything. Because when I get rid of this stuff, I'm going to give it away. You know, I'll be dead and gone. Whoever, and hopefully, whoever gets it next takes a little bit of care for, of it, and it's there for the next generation. Because I can tell you, I've talked to a lot of people, and I like old pictures. I have a lot of postcards and pictures and stuff here, and I've talked to a lot of older people and asked, you know, people will say to me, uh, well, where do you find all these pictures and stuff? Well, you got to talk to people, show people your pictures, and they'll say, well, I've got this or that, and I'll say, do you, do you want to, would you be interested in selling that? And I, I don't try to get anything from anybody for free. Uh, but... I've talked to several people, and they said, well, I had pictures like this, and I didn't think anybody was interested, so I just threw them away. You know, and, and that's just history lost. As, you know, it's a, it's a shame, but it happens. And, and, and something else we all need to do and think about, and I'm guilty of this just as bad as everybody else, but write on the back of your pictures. Put a date, a name, a location. You know, that, that's, that really, really helps out. Um, uh, moving on here, we got some national currency from the banks, from First National Bank. You had to be a national bank to issue, issue national currency. And I believe um, the bank had to deposit a certain amount of assets with the Federal Reserve, and then the Federal Reserve actually printed this money with the bank's name on it. Um, okay, let's, let's start with the order. I have a, a 10 and a $5 bill here. And I think they're dated 1910. Is that, uh, and they say First National Bank of Romney, right on them. And, and the back is usually even more interesting than the front, or at least in my opinion. This was money of the time. Yeah. And if you get out the bank, the bank has serial number 0001 hanging there on the wall. And they also have some partial cut sheets. They actually cut the sheets apart down here at the bank themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they went to the smaller sized notes. Here's a 20, a 10, and a 5. And it says here, First National Bank of Romney. And, and you'd be surprised that it, it would not be unheard of to come across one of those in circulation. Are they silver certificates? No, they're not a silver certificate. No. Uh, no. They aren't. Um, did you acquire most of your things at auction? Or well, collectors? I, I've inherited some of it. <clears throat> I've bought at antique shops. Collecting is a lot of what I spend my spare time doing, whether it's at auctions, at uh, antique shops, going to antique shows, through the internet. And, and like I said, when I get to show my pictures to people and stuff, somebody will say, you know, I know so-and-so's got this or that, and, you know, you call them up and say, you know, I'd like to see those. 
and uh, most of the time people are quite accommodating and you know every once in a while you'll run into somebody that'll just shut you down and say no I'm not interested go away and click the phone hangs up or whatever <laughs> but uh, uh, most people are accommodating and uh, to a lot of people it, it is just junk unfortunately but I, I like it so I hoard it up <laughs> me and the spiders in my house but um, moving along here I have a, a piece of pottery that was a, a advertisement from a store here in Romney. This is a Sheets and Kirkendall uh, crock, and the Sheets and Kirkendall store was down on the corner opposite of the courthouse where the theater was. And that was the Sheets and Kirkendall store, probably in the 1870s, 1880s, somewhere along in there. I've talked to, um, these, these are really collectible. I mean, I, I could send this to Seattle wouldn't sell it, probably. It, it, this, this is a piece that doesn't have just local interest. This is a piece that has national interest. People collect crocs. I mean, it, you, have, you do not have a hard time selling a croc. What kind of store was it? Um, general merchandise, I believe. Because I, I, I know um, where there's, I, I know somebody that has the coffee grinder that was there in the store and there's other things around and stuff. So, right, tell me which one was on the corner where they tried to have the coffee shop a couple of times. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I've, 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 I've talked to uh, a few people here locally that feel that these were made here in Hampshire County. I don't believe that to be true. I think they were made in southwestern Pennsylvania and uh, brought down here. Uh, there, there was, there's a huge history of this type of pottery in southwestern Pennsylvania around Washington, PA, and that area. Well, you can see it has some green grease spots on it and whatnot. They would have stored everything in these from dry grain to pork belly. Then they would pack them full of salt and throw us slab of meat in there and then put some more salt on top and sounds like good healthy eating doesn't it <laughs> and, and th this pottery comes in all kinds of uh, forms and stuff uh, different shapes are harder to find than uh, th this is considered a jar they would have made these I've seen them up to 25 gallon and down as small as six inches I personally, I, I have a two gallon, a one gallon, and a half gallon in the sheets and curtain off from Raleigh. Um, Do you think sorry. the sheets was related to the sheets to the gun maker? I, I would almost have to assume that they would have been just because of the proximity. I mean, that's like my, well, we all have family, right? <laughs> so, but uh, my dad, I, I lived in Springfield, and there was fields that lived in Springfield, but my dad didn't associate with them, you know. <laughs> but odds are, somewhere back along the line, we're all related. Do you know where yeah. the gun maker's uh, property was? Um, was it on uh, Jersey, Mountain, Jersey Mountain? And I believe it just burnt here a year or so ago. What, what, what's the guy's name on? Uh, where's Seville and the house? It, is he a farm? Was it was it Jersey Mountain, Jersey Mountain. Mm -hmm. That's where they. And, and, and I think there's one of the markers out there that designates it as the sheep's property, and that they were the, the gun manufacturers. Uh, but back to the pottery um, forms, the jars. I've seen jugs from here in Hampshire County. I don't own any, but I've seen three or four of them, and they made pitchers and chamber pots, all kinds of utilitarian type pieces and most all of it is highly collectible so the, the, this is a good marketable piece um, the, this next piece is just uh, a calendar from uh, Guthrie and Henderson's funeral home which was located in Springfield um, and actually the building is still there the big white house that sits in the middle of the turn right in town that was Guthrie's funeral home and, uh, one that has a new signing and stuff on it. Yes. Yeah, just, just, is it gray now? I live there. Is it gray? 
see there, I live there, and don't even pay any attention to what color it is. Well, it was always white when I was a kid. And your funeral uh, home was in the part next to the highway. Mm -hmm. the Close, closest and, to 28. Yeah, yeah. Stone Park, right. Uh, you know, it's all framed. The stone part is just a facade that they put on there in the last 10 years. I had went there. I've been there all my life, and uh, I knew people that laid the rest there, and I've been in there when it was a funeral home. There was a sheriff from Springfield by the name of Guthrie. Yes. N.B. Guthrie. Newt, Newt Guthrie. Uh, now, now, now that you mention that, I have a full plate, tin type picture of Newt Guthrie. And, no, it's a different subject. Um, and apparently, I didn't know it, but they were in partnership with the funeral home in Paul Paul, something else I learned when I collected this calendar, because it has uh, Paul Paul and Springfield on it. What year is the calendar? It is a 54, 1954. C could you hold it up, please, Fred, so I could get a picture? Oh, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and topics for collecting are as wide-ranging and varied as anything that you can think of. I know people that collect just yardsticks. Yeah. Sounds exciting, huh? <laughs> but I did happen to find a yardstick with an advertisement on it from Springfield. So, you know, couldn't pass it up. <laughs> What's the advertisement? <laughs> it is Eileen's Groceries. And it, it had been a store in Springfield for a long time. Cherries, Cherries run the store where it was located. Uh, the building's still there now, and it houses a plumber. But uh, and this was probably in the '70s, I imagine. Mary Springfield. Um, if you <laughs> head <laughs> head north on 28, nine miles, it's the little town with the big curve. Uh -huh. And well, now since this, since we mentioned that, uh, a lot of people don't realize that that curve hasn't always been there. That curve was put in, I believe, in 1928, so that the, the well. The main highway for traffic was from Cumberland to Winchester, and it went straight through and over the mountain and down through Slainsville and Little Cacapon and into Capon Bridge. So Romney was the county seat. They wanted the traffic to come into Romney, so they built that curve in the middle of town and shot the traffic to Romney so that they could get on Route 50. Cool. And the rest is history. Yeah. 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 Some of the old road is still there. Yeah. The old road is still there. You Some of it, yeah. Parts. You know how brown when you used to have the pizza shop? Yeah. It comes down in behind there. If you look, you can see it. I, I actually have. I have, have, up there, I I have uh, aerial view mm -hmm. pictures on uh, Charlie Hall's uh -huh. website, and you can really it's see the old road. In those aerial view pictures, mm -hmm. it shows up pretty good. Um, oh, well, postcards. Postcards are another huge uh, collectible subject, and I've been collecting them for a good while. Uh, and they are as very like you'd be surprised at the things that they take a picture of and make postcards out of. Even even a lot of the early ones, there was guys that went around from farm to farm. You'll find a lot of posts. I actually have a picture postcard of my great grandfather and uh, uh, another guy and his horse John, and uh, they made a post. They sold, you know, postcards from farm to farm, and that's how those gentlemen made their living. Uh, yeah, that one of your mother when she was a little girl. You? That one of your grandmother. The grandmother, yeah. Uh, yeah, and the one of my grandmother was probably made at the same time too, because she was there on the same farm. So when they make the postcards, they would take the picture. Where would they sell the cards? Would they bring them to stores and sell? Them? They sold them there to those people on the farm, and then those people on the farm then sent them to family and friends. Yeah, huh? yeah, they, they were regular yeah. lemon postcards. I did yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's never knew that. Yeah. And, and, and well, if you really get lucky collecting postcards, 
you find people that have the original old albums because people have been collecting postcards as long as people have been sending postcards. If you got a postcard in the mail, you had an album and you took it and you put it in that album and you kept it forever. And if I can find those people that have got those albums, uh, I'm having a good day, you know. So, but uh, usually uh, uh, you go to a sale or something, if there's an album there, there is somebody there that's in the business of making a living over the internet. They'll buy that album, split it up, and sell them one at a time on the internet. Yes, sir? Does anyone here besides me know what happened 49 years ago today? Let's see. Who was born? Man. It's got to be somebody's birthday. Exactly. Uh, How did you come up with that quick? Who was it? It's good. Today's the anniversary. Well, my brother's birthday. But, but, but that only happened if you believe that happened. Right. Apparently some people, don't, few, the, some people don't believe that actually happened. Well, the people who don't believe it happened belong in a mental institution. <laughs> well, uh, if you ask me, there's a lot of people that belong in a mental institution, but that, that's a broad subject. Uh, yeah, talk, get, getting back to the postcards, um, working over at the Davis house, I found a lot of postcards, and I put them in albums like you have, mm -hmm. but you can get an insight to people's life. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah it's very well, interesting. Just the picture on the front, but... Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I think I mentioned Steve, who's on the board there. Those girls had a life. Yeah. You know, they might have died <laughs> old maids, but uh, they had guys at some Valentine's. And, yeah. and you learn a lot about family just reading the back of the cards. Oh, yeah. yeah a, a I, I have a postcard in here from the Guthrie family. Apparently, some of them were, I believe they were in Philadelphia visiting or something. And they all got together and went up to the uh, barn and listen to the horses talk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Apparently that was a big thing at the time, kind of sort of like uh, tipping cows nowadays, <laughs> or, you know, because I'm pretty sure we all know that horses don't talk until you got to Mr. Ed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> this is kind of uh, out of my neighborhood, but it's Hampshire County. It is a water bottle from Cape and Springs, and it actually says on it, bottled only by WH Sale, Cape and Springs Water, Hampshire County, West Virginia. And uh, I, I, it's the only one I've ever seen. Uh, I'm sure there, there's another subject. Uh, if, if it is a commercially made product, odds are there's more than one of them. It, it's really, truly hard to find anything that was commercially made. And I, I know a lot of people say, well, this is really rare. I've, I've got the only one that there is, or, but it's hard to believe that that's the case. Uh, it, there are times where it is the case, but it, it's truly, truly, it's like winning the lottery if you got something and it's a, actually a one-of-a-kind. And usually that one-of-a-kind slogan is a, a sales slogan, you know. You got the one and only, the price is going to go up. Um, banks? What, you, what's, what's the, excuse me, Fred, what's the date on the, is there a date on that? That bottle? No, I no, there's not. I, I, I don't else? know a whole lot about it because it's kind of the other end of the county, you know. Well, uh, the reason I ask is uh, after we're done here, I'll I'll take a photo of it and send it to uh, Jonathan Bellingham, who who's uh, his family runs Cape and Springs. Okay, well, and he he would probably have a good source because uh, the you know you trace the deeds, you could see when Mr. Sale actually owned the property. Yeah, because it's got his name there. And I think so. that's I think that's that same family, and they do have an awful lot of the older, not awful lot memorabilia of the, of the old glass, early glass bottles. Oh really? Oh, oh there at Cape Springs. Yes. Well, that, that yeah. might have to be a weekend trip. I yeah. make sometime. Oh, I'm sure that. Well, yeah. if, if I get your email, I'll, I'll I'll let you know what he says, and okay. then I'll... That, that would be great, sir. Yeah, I'd appreciate that. Yeah, and uh, I, I'm telling you, I was really worried about doing this because I'm not a public speaker, and I was really carefully on the crowd asking questions and participating. Otherwise, this might have been the shortest presentation that we've ever had. You're doing a, a beautiful job. Yeah, you're doing yeah, great. You're great. Really great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, but uh, it's, it's not something that I prefer to do. Actually, Dot had tried to get me to do it for a long time, and then uh, Carol kind of cornered me on the telephone. I told Dot it's a lot easier to tell someone no over the internet 
You might have to come back because uh, I'm sure you got other stuff. Well, yeah. I, I, I was going through the house and gathering this stuff up, and I'm thinking, am I taking too much? Have I not got enough? And so, anyhow, um, we got more advertisements here. Uh, First National Bank gave out these uh, small banks, and uh, I, I've gathered them up. Uh, of course, uh, I'm sure they range in age greatly, but uh, and I know the Bank of Romney also gave out one that looks like a book. I just haven't got the opportunity to buy one of them yet. They had one that looked like a Liberty Bell, too. Oh, really? They had a wooden top on it, and it was about this, this tall. Well, there's something to keep my eye, uh, yeah. eye open for. Uh, I've seen a First National one that was a stagecoach, and I didn't buy it for some reason or another. But if you can find them and you get a key with them, that's a big bonus. I know uh, uh, Loudon Thompson's came up for sale down at Headley's here a few months ago and I went down and uh, I left a bid on it but I got outbid by somebody here locally and uh, kind of helped him with locating a key. A lot of times they're full of money or they've got some money you know, and you'd be surprised at the people that will take it and destroy the bank just trying to find out that there's full of pennies. <laughs> so uh, um, here's, here's a sign that I've recently purchased and I guess we still live in a small community because uh, uh, I was having some work done on my house and the guy working on my house says, wow, I really like that sign. He said, I was out there at the sale when it was sold and then I'm someplace else and, you know, I hear this sign sold out in Augusta. And yeah, I got the sign, you know. It's, so word gets around. When, but this is uh, Dave Shears. And Dave's shoe store was located down where, um, Helping hands. Anderson's. Yeah, Anderson's, along through there somewhere. Next door, Pat, next door down. Yeah. Um, and uh, apparently Mr. Shear was uh, mayor here in Romney for a good while. And my mother, she can remember going to Shear's to buy her shoes. You know, you got a one pair of shoes a year. Black and white saddle watches. Oh, yeah, black and white saddle watches. <laughs> I remember uh, when you wore those. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but apparently Dave and Ada Shear run the store, and my mother just recently found out through my collecting. Uh, my sister was doing some looking on the internet, and come to find out, Mom thought Dave and Ada were husband and wife, and it turns out they were brother and sister. Did you know that, Don? Yeah. Annette actually worked with, with Dave in the store, and Ada, didn't she, in her, didn't she own the store in Kaiser? Yeah. yeah. The, the yeah. Sister. Is that right? Yeah. Annette was his wife. Though. Right, Annette was his wife. Oh. So they were learning more. Yeah, yeah well, don't say anything in the history of him having a wife. Oh, really? Yeah. They lived another down, sister. They lived down on Valley Street, brick and, house um, about yeah. halfway up on the left. Oh, really? <laughs> Uh, the I heard something about the shears. I think in the beginning, Dave's father came here real early, and he had a salvage yard in the back of his in the building. I think it's before he built that new building that's there now. And he collected uh, all kind of metal junk and sold it. And I think that's where he made his money to get the business. And then he had several children. They all. But yeah. do you know of any descendants and that are? Ada would go to New York every fall and buy all the you know buy all the clothes that they wanted huh. to sell. And, and he even, he even uh, sold uh, uh, tailor-made coats, suits, yeah. pants. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Wow, um, that's quite a story. I Great. I also have another. Uh, one of Dave's signs, and it is an Endicott Johnson's. This one is for Wits shoes. I've never heard of Wits, but I have heard of the Endicott Johnson. I believe they're still around. Did you ever know Mr. Shearer? No, I did not. No. Well, he was probably about four and a half feet tall. Right. Yeah. He was tiny. Well, I, I, very distinguished. Dick, Dick Ansel. Very distinguished. Dick Ansel, if you remember Dick. Oh, yeah, he's a cousin. He was an attorney here in town. And he tells the story that one time that he had, uh, he was representing somebody that was charged with a 
offense here in town. And Luke Hooter, who was the chief of police at the time, had arrested this man. And so Dave Shear, being the mayor, was also a municipal judge. And so they took his uh, defendant before Dave Shear, before the judge. And uh, Dick said um, that he was there to represent this gentleman for this particular charge. And Dave said, well, he said the chief wouldn't have arrested him if he wasn't guilty. <laughs> so I did the trial didn't take long. <laughs> uh, uh, who or what was Endicott Johnson? Um, it, they were a manufacturer of shoes, and, and I, I, I'm pretty sure they're still in business nowadays. <laughs> I, I think they're. They had shoe stores up there, but I don't know if that. Endicott had done that, I think. Right. But I don't know if that was the guy's name. I don't know if that relates to being up in the area. I bet it does. Yes, sir. You were starting with your, your grandfather was a horse trader. What year is that? Was that 19? He was born in 1898, so probably 20s. through the 20s. Yes. Through the 50s? Or did he, do it all? Um, he died in 56. Oh, okay. So, and I, I believe, uh, well, you're not you're not local, correct? Yeah, um, In Springfield is a housing development called Greenfield, and that was his farm. It was uh, 283 acres. Wow. And now it's a lot of cedar trees and a few houses. Yeah. And uh, but I have aerial view pictures of Springfield, and there's not a cedar tree in sight. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure he would not be pleased with the, the condition of the farm now. In 1960, the Avalon 28, that whole uh, like in front of the BP. Yeah, in front of the BP to the next roadway. My I can remember my husband planting corn in there. He plowed it and painted And I, I don't believe my grandfather ever owned a tractor either. No. What was your grandfather's first name? Frank Fields. Frank, yep. Frank, yeah. Frank and his brother Walt owned the farm. And if you know Walter Fields yes. down Green Spring, Walter yeah. would be his grandson yeah. on the brother's side. So he never owned a tractor? Didn't own a tractor. Yeah. It along with horses. Horse. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he, he also did a lot of dealing with a guy up at uh, Frostburg by the name of Les Engel. And if anybody's ever had Engel's bologna, or he was a butcher. And of course, he came to Springfield, and Frank Fields knew all the farmers around and knew who, what, who had what for sale and what was getting old. And they went around and uh, you know, acquired animals of questionable pedigree and made bologna out of them. Wow. Well, but but you have to remember back in those days when an animal yeah, yeah, was remember. yeah you you didn't just let that animal pass away yeah. it, it was of value and when it stopped doing its purpose then it became dinner yeah. whether they're yeah. sick or well they butchered them and yeah mm -hmm. uh, my 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 grandparents' farm was uh, pretty famous for doing butchering apparently they do that like a week a year or so in around Thanksgiving. And uh, I've seen uh, written where the blood would run down the lane, clear out to the main road. You know, you, you butcher a couple of cattle and maybe a dozen hogs or something. And uh, my my dad also. That's another point. My mother and father both were very generous in telling stories of the local people. And uh, you know, it, it's always interesting and. There's a lot of it that probably is not politically correct nowadays. So I'll just say that uh, when they butchered, the poorer people in the community come around and got the parts that you know the people that owned the animals didn't necessarily want, like the lungs, yes. kidneys, uh, you know, and they were probably very grateful to get that kind of meat for nothing. So, you know, none, none of it went to waste or anything. Like I said, if the animal had lost its usefulness, then it became dinner. Just like the Brady French. You remember when I told you about the Brady French? The Hayes uh, rental, storage rentals, the old uh, Hayes? Yes. Mm -hmm. You remember that? Yeah, Brady tell the story. Again. What's, the, what's the story? Uh, Brady French? Yeah, what about her? Uh, Dot didn't know that she owned the house. There were the storage buildings. Where the storage buildings. things is. In Springfield. So, 
Um, so if anybody's got any other questions, or uh, I think I'm running short on information here. I, 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 I probably could stand up here and talk and tell stories all day, but it, it's not something I'm real comfortable with. But. So how big is your storage area? <laughs> now, like I said, I live with it. It's, it's all throughout the house. The, the, the whole house is just... The bed that I live in is from the 18, or sleep in is from the 1830s. My chest of drawers and dressers and stuff are all antique. I, I, the only really new furniture in my house are, uh, well, the couch and I have two upholstered wing chairs. So I probably have three pieces of modern furniture in my house. Yes, ma'am. The Charles Bowen home in Springfield. Uh -huh. That same guy go to our house that go his. Okay. And um, McLaughlin was his name. What do you know about that house? I know it has history. Um, back as far as I know, um, I know it was owned and operated as a hotel. A hotel. As right. by Lawson and Ida Blue. Which house? Charles Bowen's on the. At the post office. You know where the post office is. To uh, take care of putting the. Name. <laughs> on her tombstone for it, which, you know, so. Uh, Where were the stables? Were there stables, in, like your father's stable with horses at his I, farm? I don't know. Oh, yeah, there, there, there was a feed mill, you know, the, the <laughs> Presbyterian church is now? Yeah. Um, there was a feed mill there, and uh, I know Guthrie's uh, also stored their horse-drawn hearse. Um, Dick Ansel's brother, Brud, uh, he was telling me that uh, he helped tear that feed mill down when they tore it down. And he sold me a piece of this pottery, except for it's a Cumberland piece, uh, that he got out from underneath that feed mill when they tore it down. So there, there's another one of those instances where I'm talking to somebody about something there in Springfield, and it leads to me buying a piece of pottery from them. And that church is old, right? That's a no, 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 no. The, the, the Methodist church is the old one. Um, the Presbyterian is where you go around the turn where the funeral home is, or was, the next brick, like next door to oh, Julie Frazier. Yes, okay. Is Brody Ansel still alive? No, Brody passed. He passed right before dying. Uh, uh, um, Mary, Betty Catherine. Betty Catherine is the only one left. Out of she lives in the West, right? Ohio. Ohio. Yes. Yep. And she's considerably younger. Yes. So many of the uh, younger people in their twenties, thirties, forties have really don't have as much interest in antiques uh, mm -hmm. anymore. I know when I travel around uh, the country and go in antique shops, they have great stuff, and I say, "Wow, where'd you get this?" Usually in a state, they said, we don't have to go to estate sales. People bring it in. I said, what do you mean people? The, who are inheriting from their parent, maybe their 80-year-old parents who passed away. They don't want it. Yeah, don't yeah, want yeah, it. yeah, I agree. I, just stuff, they don't want it. I agree 100%. And I, I, here's testimonial to it. I was at an auction last weekend, and they sold a three-piece oak bedroom suit, a bed, a, a dresser with mirror, and the washstand. And what would you believe that it brought $10? No. The whole bedroom suit oh brought $10. That's why I'm saying, you know, if you want to collect, oh you know, you're not going to get rich. But thing is, if kids were smart nowadays, they'd be better off to go to an auction and pay $10 for that oak, real wood bedroom set than they would be to go over to the furniture store and pay $2,500 for sawdust and glue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that's understandable. But I, even uh, glassware and stuff, um, the kids nowadays don't seem to have much sentimentality. But the the collecting has went through this before, and I'm hoping you know that it'll change. But if it doesn't, you know, like I said, when I get rid of this stuff, I'm giving it away. Um, there's stories of Tiffany lamps through the 30s and 40s and stuff would be out on the sidewalks in New York City and the uh, trash man would come along and they'd take and hit them against the curb, bust the glass out of them, take the lead and recycle it, re resell it for money and you know that's what happened to a lot of Tiffany lamps. Yep. Yeah, if they only knew. You talk about value. <clears throat> 
some other folks here may have seen the article this week too. Uh, a collector in Denver, he's also an attorney and he collects memorabilia. Mm -hmm. Has apparently the best, most the best graded Mickey Mantle, Mickey Mantle rookie ball. baseball card, 1952. Uh, it's worth ten million dollars. Yeah. I mean, everybody says it's worth ten million dollars. He has it insured for twelve million, and he put it on public display at the mm -hmm. museum for three days. And they took it from the bank vault where he keeps it to the museum in an armored car. Yeah. And, and so, I, I, think, I, I think he said he paid one hundred twenty thousand. I was going to say I think he, he only paid a few hundred thousand dollars yeah. for it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But he said he goes to the bank once a year. And he goes in <laughs> just, just to make sure it's still there. Huh? <laughs> And, and that's a ballpark, you know, but the thing with that is um, there's another one of those commercially made items. Mm -hmm. And if you watch the Antique Roadshow, there's still people showing up on the Antique Roadshow with baseball cards from the 1870s and 18. Yeah. I think some of the highest, one of, one of the highest appraised items that they've ever appraised was a collection of baseball cards that a lady showed up with from the 1800s. So, yeah, because nothing yeah. over the 50s is going to get you any money this year. So. Unless you got a Mickey Mantle that's in really good shape. <laughs> really, really, really. As good a shape as he was in. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's the thing. That, and, and that was something that was made for kids. And uh, a lot of kids opened it up, grabbed the bubble gum, and you know, threw the cards. Either that or took and ripped them and stuck them in the spokes of their bicycle right. and click, 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 click all the way down the road. You play, uh, you throw them against the wall. Yeah, well, yeah. And, and, and as far as the collector is concerned, that just ruins them because the corners round off and they're, they're worthless once the corners round off. Interestingly enough, they said, this article said, and I don't know if they did it every year, but they said one of the reasons why these 52 cards were so rare, not just Mickey Mantle, but all 1952s. This is Tops, right? It's tops. Yeah, Tops. Uh, was because at the end of the year, they were trying to make room for the new 1953 inventory. And they took the old ones out on to the barge the in the Hudson River and sank it. Yeah. Yeah, I do remember reading that now that you mentioned it. Increase the value. Yeah. 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 Well, but, you oh. know, back then, though, the value oh, was so three cents. Right. right, it was five cents. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of um, collectibles were thrown away by parents. Well, yeah. 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 And I, I, but I do still, occasionally, and we've hit a couple this spring. We, we, we mostly hit an auction a week, pretty much. Um, been to several sales that had a lot of toys that parents had hung on to and were in really good shape. I mean, the, the, it, it's funny the difference in kids. That it seems that they're either one extreme or the other. They got nice toys and they set them up and looked out and didn't play with them, or they were the exact opposite and they, you know, just beat them to death and uh, wore them out. And, and that's like with collecting bicycles. The girls' bicycles are still around in good shape because girls weren't as rough on them as the boys were. Boys were jumping on them and, you know, busting the tires and whatnot and wrecking them and mashing the fenders off. And so girls, girls' bicycles are around in a lot better shape than what the boys are. We went to an auction out of Baltimore Pike about six weeks ago. Something like that. And those kids must have had anything they wanted. Yeah, they, they were very lucky kids. <coughs> I bought a high back doll baby bed for the cat. And they had three of them. Same way with wicker chairs. Those kids. And, 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 and these, these are old toys. I, I'd say they were probably turn of the century or so, 1900s. A lot, a lot of cast iron toys and stuff. These weren't the Barbie dolls from the 60s and 70s that, you know, a lot of people do collect nowadays. And it's supposed it? to have been out of Cumberland. The estate was from the Cumberland area. I was going to say, what was the family name? I, I, they, they didn't mention a family name, but it, it, it was very nice stuff. Uh, you said the Baltimore bike? Well, yeah. uh, that's just outside of Cumberland. Oh, okay. Na 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 National Highway runs through Cumberland. So. 41, 44. Yep. Fred, I've heard that um, and thought about this a lot too, because I like to collect or used to. I don't want to work. <laughs> but um, the fun was and the challenge was finding the piece. Yeah. Yep. And cool. now with eBay and with 
the computer. You can no. find anything. No. You can find for, any missing glass piece. For the most part, yes. It's there. Yeah. Tell her about you know, the to replacements.com to, to get the more on I, I, I don't know if you all be familiar enough, but there's um, a pottery out there from the uh, uh, late 18th century that was made in England that they call mocha ware, just to show you values. Um, and I was in a sale at Oakland this spring, and you know this stuff is 200 years old and is very collectible, and I bought this bowl for $19. So the price of stuff is really... And that goes uh, probably uh, something that you might know more about, uh, Fostoria. A lot of people collected uh, American Fostoria. Uh, she bought for $65 a, a couple weeks ago. The one, the one bowl is about this big. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so it, it, the, the lack of interest from this generation has affected the prices of all collectibles. Unless it's uh, the latest Apple I smartphone. <laughs> It'll be outdated. Well, year. well, but you watch here in a couple of years, that very first Apple, it'll be like uh, the uh, PCs that they come up with that uh, were the first PCs. And, you know, they're, they're selling for millions of dollars now. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. if, if you can find, uh, find one that you, you can... If you can find one that you can prove has like Steve Wozniak Association that he actually built in his garage and sold, you, you, you're you're ready to retire. Yeah. Didn't, didn't somebody say here at one of these uh, meetings that uh, the old original uh, VCR video games are bringing Paul? tens of thousands of dollars? Yeah. Like Paul? Paul? Yeah. Paul? Yeah. 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 And, and unless you've got a modern flat screen TV, and you can't give them away. You can set them out along the road with free on them, and no one will take them. But uh, uh, Pong was a it was one of the first that I remember, and I think Atari put it out, and it was just a little, like you play, played like tennis, and you hit a, a, a dot on the screen back and forth and back and forth. And that, yes, and that, that was great entertainment at the time. But now even like the uh, little chips that go in Game Boys, the different games and stuff, will bring outrageous prices. Yep. So. And Star Wars. Yeah, Star Wars. Everything is, early Star Wars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Action Comics. Do you remember Action Comics? Mm -hmm. I was at the first. The first Superman was in there. Superman number one. Comics, yeah. The first appearance was 1939. Speaking of the baseball cards. Mm -hmm. um, if it's in really good condition, like the, like the rookie cards are, it's like $1.5 million. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Yes, very. But very people nice. are still discovering them in their attic. Oh, yeah. oh. So collectibles yeah. are changing. Yeah. Yes, evolving. Well, that's, there are two reasons for that. Um, nine, I think it was 1938 or 39, somewhere in that time frame. Two reasons for that. One, uh, it was the first appearance of Superman. Or the first appearance of anybody, for that matter. And two, it was in 1938. And when World War II came along, there were these drives to get anything you could think of, including paper drives. And all, a lot of parents wanted to get rid of those comic books. Yeah. Oh, that's true. Same, same way with scrap metal. Yep, they, they did. They had drives for... But... Uh, comic books, that same sale that I was at last weekend yeah. that had the bedroom suit, an oak bedroom suit that sold for $10, they had a box of comic books, and uh, they went through and put each comic book in a Ziploc freezer baggie. Yeah. The auctioneer said, we'll sell them eight times. He said, high bidder gets their pick the first time through, and we're going to repeat this eight times, and then once we get to the ninth time, the high bidder will buy the whole box. First time through, um, the high bidder got his pick at $150 for comic book. So a bedroom, an oak bedroom suit sold for $10, comic book sold for $150. And the funny thing is that the, the high bidder, I, I'd say probably six out of the eight times was the same guy. He bought almost all of them. He just went down a little bit in price every time. That was his niche. 
Yeah. Wouldn't, yeah. wouldn't they have, the auctioneer have been better to just say, all right, you're the high bidder, how many of these at the same price would you like to purchase? Yes, Instead of them going down and down. Yeah. Well, he, that, 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 you go from one auction to the next, and you know how each auctioneer does it will vary from one to the next. I, 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 it, it's pretty common around here, I think. I've been to a lot of sales where they would uh, say have, I don't know, something that is a living room suit that is three or four pieces. And they'll say, well, we'll sell it piece by piece, and then we'll put it up and sell it all at once, and whichever brings the most is how we'll sell it. I was up in Pennsylvania, up uh, above Somerset, and they had uh, some painted furniture that uh, they're pretty fond of up there. It was made locally and they call it soap hollow furniture. And uh, these four pieces had been in the same house since they were manufactured. So they kind of felt that, you know, it should all stick together. Well, then the local collectors, they couldn't afford to buy, you know, I mean, when, when a chest of drawers is going for $25,000 and you take and put four pieces together and sell it all at once, you know, you can't, well, most people can't afford that. And they were pretty upset that he did it that way. But he got the most money for his customer, and that's what he's there for. I've seen them bring 20 and $30 at auction. Yeah, you know, they, yeah they just don't know. And, and that's a big thing of collecting is knowledge. You know, you know, you could be there and a Tiffany lamp could come up for sale, and if you didn't know it was a Tiffany lamp, then odds are you're not going to be interested, and, and you're going to miss out on a bargain. So... Uh, Knowledge, read books, look at the internet, you know, it, it, it uh, is a big part of collecting. You've grown over the years to, to specialize in certain things like the postcards and the crops and the different things. Mm -hmm. So, the more you learn about that, the more aware you are of, of those kind of things. Yes. If, if you just go to an auction and you're not, you see something else, it catches your eye, but you don't know any right. Well, well, like, you know, the pottery is my special thing. I, I, I've got a hundred crocs. Uh, but if, if I go to a sale, you know, with the intent of buying a croc, and I see a Dave Shear sign, then odds are my, my interest is going to shift from the croc to the sign, unless it would happen to be a wrong croc. <laughs> Is the Sheets and Kirkendall the only crop made in Hampshire County, or were there others? Right offhand, I don't know of any others. I'm not saying that that's the fact. I've been told that there were some potters around that made pottery and sold it, but I don't know that it's marked and it's easily identifiable. These style, you'll find these, I have... I think five different Cumberland ones. I have Kaiser, Old Town, Frostburg, Alona County. So a lot of the little towns around the stores paid these potters to make these advertisement pieces for them. And so, some places may have sold them, some of them may have given them away as, you know, uh, yes, promotional pieces. And uh, probably better customers got better pieces or whatnot, you know. So when you said that could have been made in Pennsylvania, Sheets and Kirkendall could have purchased those and said put our label yes, on Yes, yes, exactly. And odds are that is the case of what happened. I actually found one in Winchester years ago. Yeah. Yes, I, I got lost. I was traveling and, you know, we didn't have GPS or anything. And I came across this little antique shop and I thought, well, might as well find lost, go in there and look around. And I was talking to the fellow and I said, do you have any... Crocs. And he said, yeah, they're over there. And I said, I'm looking for a, a crop for mommy. And he said, you know, I was just in Moorfield this weekend and went to a large auction. And it was in Moorfield. And I said, can we just like unwrap them? I'll help you. you know, they weren't even out of the boxes yet. So it must have been like on a Monday. I don't remember now. I brush, I got one. And I remember being so nervous. I gave $400 back then. And that was a lot of money. But I really, really wanted one, and I just saw it's got a little tiny chip in it. But anyway, I just remember coming home thinking, and Bill never says anything about anything else. It's going to kill me. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to tell you how much I paid. And a second, I was like, what am I going to wrap 
the sin. As long as they hit me in the rear end. Uh, well, I, we and discussed I that like, on the way up here today. Yeah, that's how, you, <laughs> they felt, but that's how I came across yeah. it. Yeah. And it was uh, in a little old shop in Winchester. And, he's, and he had gotten it out of Moorfield, so they did travel around. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah, it's from Cape Bridge. Uh, that, that dealer was from Cape Bridge. Yeah. He's dead now. Yeah. Given. It was a given man that owned those shop. And he uh, was from Cape Bridge. I forget his first name. I did too. But he did have a shop in, in uh, Winchester. Yes, yeah. it was. I, 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 I could probably. <coughs> I might have to scratch my brain a little bit here, but I could probably tell you 30 or 40 of these here in Hampshire County. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the thing is, though, the people that have got them aren't going to sell them. Mm -hmm. I, 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 the last one I bought was probably five, six years ago, and I think the one before that I looked, and I, I, I tried to keep my receipts. It had been nine years since I know one being sold before that one. but. I have, like I said, a two gallon or one gallon, and I have three half gallons. Mm -hmm. So I have five of them. And I've never seen anything bigger than this two gallon, but I've recently been told a story of a guy in Wardensville that bought one out of Tennessee that is a five gallon. And he, he paid a lot of money to get it, and I heard that he was pretty disappointed when he got it because it was in pretty bad shape. But uh, if I come across a five gallon one, no matter what shape it is, it's in, I'm going to have to consider buying it. I, I was told he paid $4,500 for it. Wow. So. Mine's smaller. It's more, don't you feel about like that? I guess it's <laughs> quarter size. Yeah. I know um, James Slocum has one with the, uh, the, the jug. Jug. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, Jill Reynolds, I know she has one. A jug or a jar? Jug. Or, I'm sorry, jar. A jar. And then Danny Seville has one. I believe Danny has sold his. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, the cat, yeah. Knocked, the cat, it. The cat knocked it off. And he, he had sure. it repaired. <laughs> yeah. Goodbye, cat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody have a listing of instructions as to how how to make these things? Uh, not that I know of, because I'm pretty sure if they knew how to make them and pass them off as period pieces, they'd be doing it. Somebody Man. might be somewhere. Well, that's possible, but I know uh, a lot of uh, uh, items that are like nationally collected as opposed to locally, mm -hmm. where you would have a lot more interest. Say Fiesta. P P Fiesta was made here in West Virginia in the 50s, 40s, and 50s, mm -hmm. and uh, they also it was popular enough that uh, they started making it again and selling it. In department stores. Mm -hmm. So if you're a Fiesta collector, well, I'm, I'm certain that people that collect Fiesta can look at the old stuff and the new stuff and tell you instantly the differences. Well, but if, some, if somebody knows how to tell the difference, that same person knows how it can be fake. Well, that, 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 you're, you're, there's a possibility you're right there. But uh, that, that's, that's, that, yeah, that, that's your part of your learning process with collecting. You, you, I mean, there's always somebody out there that's trying to sell you something that's not what it claims to be, you know. So you learn. And I've, I've bought things that, you know, weren't what I thought they were, and everybody gets burned. And uh, it's just chalk it up to your learning experience. You mentioned Cheats and Kirk and Dolan. You may know this, but I, I think when the Bank of Romney was formed, there wasn't a bank building. They just worked out of the safe at Sheets and Kirk and Dahl's store. I oh, really? Several times, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, they eventually moved somewhere else. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's in Mr. Miller's history of the Bank of Romney. Was the Bank of Romney's first location over on the corner? Or is that, or they were in the workman building for a while, weren't they? So. And then it burnt? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I do remember that now. Yeah. Okay. Anybody got anything else? I think it's time for me to quit because I got uh, very cramp good. in my body. Very, very good. <laughs> yeah, you make it. I don't know about all that. Thank you for having me. And, and hopefully we can get somebody to do next month. We have next we have month. Do we? Do we? Okay, good. Thank you. There's somebody. I'll turn this over to you and you can. Thank you. You know, this is the kind of stuff that we all wish that we could fall into at some roadside stand and have you with us so that we would know what we were buying, right? Or hoping to buy. 
I, I hope everybody gets a chance to come up here and flip through these and look at these banknotes, which are just fascinating, and all this stuff. Thank you so much. And we do have uh, Dan Oates coming next month, always the third Friday of the month. And then the following month, um, Mike Smith, long ago, promised me. And we just talked a little bit before this. And so he is the big knowledge base for the Coca-Cola bottling company. And so um, we may be meeting at the Coke plant on that night, but we'll we'll put it in the paper and get it out. Because what's Dan gonna talk about next month? The census. Oh, that's right. oh, yes. yes. And while I wanted him to do um, or Charlie Hall wanted him to do the census related to the First World War, he was more interested in um, doing the census where people could still be alive and and look at what he has. So I'm not sure which years he's bringing, but I know it'll be good no matter what.